Welcome to Northwest Bible Church. Glad you joined us again this morning. We are going to continue our in-depth look into the letter to the Romans. I'd like you to do something, if you would. Uh, grab your Bible. I want us to uh, read it together. Uh, and then we'll, uh, um, after we read it, we'll say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll just kind of unpack what we find out here. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is where we are. Um, and I'd like you just to uh, follow along with me as I read, but there's going to be some um, portions of this where you know you're going to want to do the underlining or taking notes. Matter of fact, if you um, wouldn't mind, I would like you to grab a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. Uh, there's some things I want you to write down today that I think will help you not only understanding this text, but putting this text into practice. And so we're going to be looking at some uh, things that I think will, principles that I think will help. Um, so let's begin. Uh, reading beginning at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We'll read down through verse 13. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of, is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this amazing section of your word. The freedom that we have to live life as you initially designed it. Uh, thank you for our Savior. Thank you for the power because of the Spirit of God uh, to be able to pull this thing off, this transformation that you're doing in our lives. We appreciate all that you do. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's easy to think that some people have a corner on spirituality. And there are others who uh, would like, to think, like you to think that they do. But when you're around these people, it, it seems and it's easy to be impressed with their consistency. They're not given to sudden outbursts of anger. They're not affected by the stress of circumstance. They seem to pray sincerely and deeply and often. They don't seem to worry as much as we do. And when you're around them, there seems to be a unique calm to their demeanor, a, a genuine maturity. When we examine the lives of the Old Testament prophets, they seem to be men just like that. Although they lived in constant danger, most of them dying young as martyrs, turned on by their own people, they were, although misunderstood and misrepresented by those who were misguided, the prophets seemed to have that something special called spiritual maturity. Some of the great preachers in the past, some engaged in 
pioneer mission work. They just seemed to stand taller in the crowd. Men like Jonathan Edwards and Dave, David Brainerd and John Wesley and William Carey and David Livingstone and Hudson Taylor. Even theologians from the 20th century like Lewis Berry Schaefer and his prized pupil, Charles Baker. But what is true about all of them is that within each of them was the quality of inspiring courage, profound, at the same time, weakness. How can such a dichotomy exist? Courage and weakness. How can such weak humanity achieve so much? How can such godly power be housed in frail humanity? The key is the Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit of God is the secret behind the determination of the individuals that we most admire. The end of Romans chapter 7, the great apostle wrote, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And before the ink is dry on the parchment, he adds, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul says there's this battle, this conflict, this struggle within me. One path leads me into the flesh, and one path leads me into the work of the Spirit of God. Within me, implies the Apostle Paul, there is both the old nature and the new. And within each one of us, there are those conflicting forces. One driving us down. The other one driving us upward and onward. One pulling on our urges, trying to convince us that yielding to the temptation will be satisfying. I mean, if it feels good, do it, right? On the other hand, the Spirit of God communicates deep within our soul, walk with me, trust me. I'll take care of you. And I'll help you overcome this carnal style and bring you into a realm that will cause others to be amazed, even those of your own family, those who know and love you best. So when we come to this monumental turn in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit of God is introduced to us and we begin to realize that His presence is our benefit. I'd like you to make sure you have that piece of paper and pencil or pen I told you about because I, I want you uh, to write down some things because as you write these things down and even as we say them out loud together, uh, and we're going to do that, okay? So if you're sitting there with someone else, just understand we're going to say things out loud together. Um, but you'll, you'll need this this coming week, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of it. The enemy of your soul, I want to remind you, is hearing everything you're hearing right now. And he's already plotting your spiritual demise. He's going to bring something into your life that not only irritates you, but something that will cause you to grind your teeth and want to fight back. And if you give in to that, he's got you. So you need to write these things down. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I want you to write this down. We are eternally secure in Jesus Christ. You will never be insecure in the Lord Jesus. Let the words, no condemnation, be cemented in your mind. We are eternally secure in the Lord Jesus. Whether things are going well or poorly, 
whether things, whether you have money in the bank or nothing in the bank, whether you're experiencing good health or the doctor just gave you the worst news that you could possibly hear, there is now, right at that very moment, this very moment, and every moment thereafter, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When you come to God by faith in the Lord Jesus, He adopts you into His family. And He never says, get out. That's how families work. Once you're His child, you are forever His child. You ready? All right, repeat after me. We are eternally secure in Christ Jesus. Say that. Good for you. Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Write down this second one. We are internally free from sin's dominion and domination. We are eternally secure and we are internally free. And this becomes very important when the internal battle wages, the war that wages within us. When the old nature says, I want my way, and yet you have a new nature that says, you're not going to get your way. Before you came to faith in Christ, you didn't have a new nature. Before His grace empowered your life, there was no way you could win the battle. When temptation occurred, you yielded. If the flesh wanted to travel, travel down a certain path, you, you walked down that path. If you had a selfish thought, you ran with it. But now you don't. Because you have been internally set free. Sin no longer has dominance over you. Oh, there are times when it'll be powerful, but it's not in charge. Every day... You can determine, you choose who's in charge. You can say to the Spirit of God, take over. Speak through me, use me, give me the strength, keep me from saying yes, hold me back from that temptation. And the Holy Spirit of God comes to your rescue because you are freed from the dominance of sin. And yet, we can feed the resident sin within us. You can live as though you've never come to faith in Christ. You can live like it looks like you never trusted Christ. That explains why some believers aren't known at their work or in their neighborhoods as a Christian. As a matter of fact, that's the most amazing secret in the neighborhood, that you're a Christian. They don't live as a follower of Jesus because they're saying yes to the flesh within them. And the Holy Spirit is grieved, Ephesians 4.30. The Holy Spirit is quenched in their lives, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. You can live like that if you choose. And you can choose, or you can choose the path empowered by the Spirit of God. Before you came to faith in Christ... You were caught in the grasp of your old nature, but now you're internally free. So let's repeat that principle. Ready? Repeat after me. We are internally free from sin's domination. Good. Verses 3 and 4. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. What did the law do? Tried to make us holy. But because of sin, it couldn't. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled by us. Is that what it says? No, no, no. In us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As the Spirit of God takes charge, he empowers us to live righteously. We are positionally righteous in Christ Jesus, but now the Spirit empowers us to live that same way. Here's the third thing I want you to write down. We are positionally righteous before God. Eternally secure, 
internally freed, positionally righteous. And that's just the start. That's just where we stand before God. When times are hard, when nights are lonely, when things seem to be turning against you, you you got to go back to these three great truths. I'm eternally secure in Christ. I am internally freed from sin's domination. And I am positionally righteous before God. As the poet said, nearer, nearer, nearer I cannot be, for in the person of his Son, I'm as near as he. Substitute the word righteous. And it fits. Righteous, still righteous, more righteous I cannot be. For in the person of his Son, I am as righteous as he. So you don't have to work and stress and labor and strive and pray and plead to somehow to get God to listen. Does God listen to his Son? Of course. Then he listens to you. Being in Christ, the same righteousness that applies to his son now applies to you in God's eyes. It's called grace. Now there is a contrast. If that is true, I'm set. I got it made. And that's what some people think. But the problem is that you've got those two natures that are warring with each other. And we've got to realize that the old nature will never get any better, and it never gives up. Every day it goes to work to try to control you. It's been doing that your whole life. But when you came to faith in Christ Jesus, and now there's a new master in charge, the Holy Spirit now lives within, the flesh no longer dominates. So what we've got now are these two natures. So let's track these two natures in verses 5 through 7. The old nature is called the flesh. And what we're referring to here is that fallen nature, that, that egocentric human nature, the nature we got from Adam when, we, when he fell into sin. The spiritual life or the spirit is literally the third member of the Trinity. God the Holy Spirit living within you. And he's saying to us, the moment we believe, let me take charge, I'll clean up your language, I'll clean up your mind, I'll redirect your your eyes, I'll take control of your will, but the flesh, the old nature is opposed to that. First of all, let's look at what the flesh, what happens when we walk according to the flesh. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So the first thing that you can have is a fleshly mindset. When you live according to the flesh, there is a mental orientation towards sin. My impulses begin to control me. They begin to dominate me. And human selfishness kicks into action. And when that happens, the Spirit of God is grieved. He doesn't want that because that not only does not honor Him, but that's not what's best for us. But I've made that choice, and the old nature kicks in with that fleshly mindset. The verse continues, the second characteristic of, this, of that fleshly mindset, for, the, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Don't go any further. I want the full force of that verse to sink in. When your mind set is controlled by your urges, the flesh, a death-like existence kicks in. The fleshly mindset produces within you and me an emptiness, a futility, a frustration, We're plagued by guilt and shame because that old nature took control. This is why a Christian can commit suicide. Think about this. How many people are confused and they think, man, if 
he or she committed suicide, they couldn't have been a Christian. No. A Christian can have the flesh dominate the person's thinking and bring them to the place of taking their own life. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit is grieved at that. But was that person saved? Well, if they trusted Jesus Christ, absolutely they were saved. Is there a loss or reward? Yeah. For the fullness of that life that could have honored God now can't. It's over. That kind of emptiness that that would cause a person to take a gun and put it to their chest and pull the trigger, that can be experienced by a believer. Living this life under the domination of the flesh, you respond just as you would if you didn't even know the Lord Jesus. And the thoughts of desperation and despair occupy your thinking. Paul accurately calls it death. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. Verse 7 contains a third characteristic of the fleshly mindset. For the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. As you read your Bibles, take note of these kind of things. When you operate under the domination of the flesh, you are hostile toward God and all the things related to God. You resist Him, and you resent Him, as well as others who might represent Him. That's why when there are marital problems, it might be just that one is representing what God says in His Word, but the fleshly-minded person isn't willing to hear it. I don't care what God's Word says. Don't quote the Bible to me. Christians say that just as well as non-Christians. As a matter of fact, I think I've said something similar. I mean, not recently, but I remember saying something like that to my wife. And what's worse, when my wife quotes me back what I've said the previous Sunday... Why? Why Why did that bother me? Because I'm living with my mind focused on the flesh. Operating under the control of my old nature. And when I do that, I say things I shouldn't say. What's wrong? I'm, I'm hostile to the truth. There can be open defiance against the truth of God, and it can happen to anyone where the flesh is in control. Os Os Guinness, I think, does a masterful job, probably one of the best ever, in describing our postmodern era in his book, The Long Journey Home. He writes this, The fact is that many of the greatest thinkers, writers, artists, musicians, scientists, poets, and reformers throughout Western history have been people of profound and genuine faith. And then he names some in his book. Yet faith continues to be dismissed by many of the educated and cultured as something only for the uneducated and uncultured. I don't know where you work, I don't know the group you run around with, but chances are good if you are known for your evangelical faith, whether you are around them or not, they will call you uneducated and uncultured. You're just just not with it. Anne Lamont recalls her experience of growing up near San Francisco. She said, none of the adults in our circle believed. Believing meant that you were stupid. Ignorant people believed, uncouth people believed, and we were heavily couth. Writer Ann Dillard felt obligated to tell the New York Times magazine, just because I'm religious does not mean I'm insane. And if you read the New York Times magazine, you understand that. If you're an evangelical, you are insane. 
Voltaire's notorious contempt for religion is captured in his command, crush the infamous thing. And that thinking has echoed down through the generations that followed. All of us remember the media mogul Ted Turner, who made the snide remark dismissing Christians, Christian faith as a religion of losers. What is that? It's hostility. Hostility toward God. Paul said centuries ago, for the mind that is set is hostile toward God. And then right in the middle of verse 3, we find the fourth characteristics. For it does not submit to God, to His law. Indeed, it cannot. The flesh causes us to live in a lifestyle that submits to no one. There is open defiance, hostility toward God, but there is also open defiance against anything that is an authority figure. And if you know, if you doubt that, just ask a policeman next time you have a chance to talk to them, and they'll tell you all about defiance toward authority. I cannot tell you the number of times I've, I have witnessed believers, husbands and wives, who simply will not budge. They won't back off. Both of them determined to have their way regardless. No issue ever gets resolved in marriage or in any other relationship until someone is willing to submit, until someone is willing to put something as a higher priority. But the flesh says, don't give up. Don't surrender. Stand against that. Resist that. And then there's a fifth characteristic in the same verse, an inability to obey God. Paul says, For it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, verse 8 says. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let me show you the situation in the life of a natural person when they hear the truth. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because they are folly to Him. Interesting word, folly. It's translated foolishness in other translations, but the word literally means moronic. For they are moronic to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual truths can only be understood by those who have the Spirit of God that enables them to distinguish, to evaluate. And that's why when you bring a friend to church who does, hasn't trusted the Lord Jesus and you're just soaking up what is being said, they're yawning. It isn't their fault. They don't have the Spirit of God to open their eyes to the significance of the truth. And if you get a Christian who has a fleshly mindset sitting next to you, they're miserable. It's like the Christian is, preacher is speaking a different language. They just don't get it. Try as, as we might to explain the truth, the Spirit of God is not at work in the heart and the mind of the person. You can try to have a deep conversation, but they just, they just don't understand. And that's the way it is when we choose to be fleshly minded. We know in our hearts that we should be enjoying the worship of God and the truth of His Word, but we don't. Why? Because we're operating in the flesh under the domination of the old nature. But then, let's look at what it means to walk in the Spirit. We'll go through this quickly, back to verse 5. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So the second category is being having a spiritual mindset. When you live according to the Spirit, there is a hunger for spiritual truth that can't be satisfied. 
We, we love spending time in the Word. We love to spend time in prayer. We, 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 we love pondering insights that the Lord gives us and brings to our mind. We love to talk to other people about the insights that, into God's Word and His work and His dealings with mankind. It seems like we can't get enough. Verse 6 tells us something else, but the, to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. There is a vitality of life and an inner peace when we have a spiritual mindset. Verse 9 gives us another gem. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, referring to the old nature, the, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. There is that transforming presence of the Spirit of God at work in our lives. And as we move through our days, we're looking for others that need Him as well, and we're excited about sharing the truth of freedom in Christ. Why? Because God lives within you, longing to get out and impact everyone and everything. Verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So we have this contrast between the fleshly mindset and, and the spiritual mindset. But then in verse 12, the apostle says, so then, which is a way that we say it toward the end of our sermon, so what? What's the, what's the impact? Well, he gives us two obligations we must face. Verse 12, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors. We are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So the first obligation we have, Paul says, is we must not walk according to our fleshly nature. We must develop new habits, starting today, by saying to the Spirit of God who lives within us, Lord, this is your day. My prayer is that I will not do what I want to do. I will do what you want me to do. Empower me to reflect you. Take over. And if you want to read about what happens when you allow your fleshly nature to take over, check this list in Galatians chapter 5. This is from Eugene Peterson's The Message. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for, uh, for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants. A brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes, divided lives small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on and on and on. That is the flesh within you and me. And we're capable of living that. The second obligation, Paul says, not only must we not walk according to our fleshly nature. Secondly, we must rely, not rely on our own strength, but on the Holy Spirit of God. Ella Wheeler Wilcox put it this way, one ship drives east, another drives west with the same self winds that blow. It is the set of the sails and not the gales that determines the way that we go. It isn't the wind of circumstance that matters. It's the set of the heart and the rudder of the mind that sets the direction of our lives. And you know what? There is actually a second verse to that poem. Like the winds of the sea are the ways of fate as we voyage along through life. Tis the set of the soul 
that decides its goal and not the calm or the strife. People don't make great things of their lives because everything is calm and everything is easy. It's because their hearts are set and their minds are in tune with the Spirit of God. And they determine not to operate under the control of the old nature of the flesh. Let me ask two questions and then we're done. Number one, am I absolutely certain I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Only you can answer that. And if not, you can take care of that right now. Admit that you're a sinner in need of His grace. Trust that what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you was enough to pay the penalty for your sin and then submit your heart and your mind to Him as your Lord and Savior. Do that now. Secondly, if my mind is my mind firmly set on my own fleshly desires or on God's Spirit? And again, only you can answer that. Am I a believer in the Lord Jesus? And if I am, secondly, where's my mind firmly set? I leave you to those two questions. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the truth of your word. Thank you for its impact. Thank you that we have the Spirit of God living within us as believers to empower us for the battle. Lord, give us the strength to choose your Spirit over the flesh so we can live lives that honor you and are best for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.